Ten things I hate about you is a... This film? Oh boy, let's see. God damn, how do I explain that? Um, that's a really interesting question. Ten things I hate about you is really a movie about my character. It's a nice, nice, nice movie. They're not using any of this. <laughs> None of this will ever air on anything. When people hear that I directed 10 things, they, they have such a strong and profound reaction to that film. It just spoke to people and, and thrills me. I mean, I, I couldn't think of a better thing to hear as a director. I really loved your film. I mean, it was Gil's first movie. It was all the actors' first movies for the most part. It's our first script, and to see it getting made, and to see all this whole variety of actors, like, interpreting our lines and, and you know, feeling what we'd written was so exciting. While we were trying to figure out what to write, I went through my high school diaries for ideas. I found a list of things I hate about Anthony, who was my boyfriend at the time. And I told Kirsten about that, and she's like, 10 things I hate about you. That's the title. I think it's basically about covers that people put up for themselves. You know, I think everyone's got a cover. If you're planning on asking me out again, you might as well just get it over. Do you mind? You're sort of ruining it for me. There's a ton of movies with teenagers coming out, and this one was one of the only ones that uh, didn't make me vomit. All right, you're going too far, OK? Just uh, tell me what my line is, please. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the two writers of this script are are these two young ladies, who you know really are kind of, are kind of uh, in touch with their uh, with their youth. I think. I fell in love with the script the first time I read it. I actually read it four times in one day. I like the fact that the main character, Cat, was a really strong woman. Okay, but how do we get him to look left? Uh, uh like this. We got a lot of a lot of a lot of really pretty fun innuendos and stuff. How about David Krumholtz at the end of that one scene where Andrew Keegan draws a penis on his face? <laughs> that to me it was so funny. I have a penis on my face, don't I? <laughs> I think we were just under the radar or something, because I, I mean, yeah, I look at the movie now, it's like, I mean, that is like, it's it's like an R-rated movie now, for sure. Sweet love, renew thy force. Hey, don't say shit like that to me. People can hear you. The story is initially based on Taming of the Shrew, obviously, and uh, the similarities are the shrew, cat, uh, the Julie Stiles character, and how does one tame her? Oh, a lot more than you think. <sighs> doubtful. Very doubtful. I love Shakespeare, and so, to a although I didn't like Taming of the Shrew, as a matter of fact. By he, I take it you mean Shakespeare. Is there anyone else worth starving for? One of the first scenes where Kat is introduced, she's arguing with her teacher about, um, about Hemingway. And I had an argument of, that was very similar with my English teacher about Taming of the Shrew. Weird coincidence. But imagine things he'd say during sex. Shakespeare. Like, get out of my bed, Mandela. You're pissing off my gay lover. Most of the characters in the movie have some relation to Taming of the Shrew, uh, name-wise. I looked up, there was no one for me. And, I, and then in the end, though, I'm William Shakespeare. I dress up as William Shakespeare. So that's what I'm calling myself. I'm the William Shakespeare of the movie. I'm the guy that sets up the whole deal. I'm sort of the uh, puppeteer. The whole entire thing is humorous just in general because of the whole situation is very complicated and kind of surreal and fast and uh, kind of how Shakespearean comedies are. We did actually go through this giant book of Shakespeare and highlight things that we could work into dialogue like I think Cromwell tells a line like, assail your ears for just one night when he's trying to convince Patrick to go to the bar. I burn, I pine, I perish. Of course you do. Newly rampalian yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and then that's, of course, paired with like, remove head from sphincter and then right. drive. <laughs> Sacrifice yourself on the altar of dignity and even the score. We were young writers, you know, and we just wrote how we were that's thinking we talk, and talking yeah. and feeling and, and, um, it was probably like blind naivete. Karen and Kiwi, they wrote a script that not only was very funny, but captured a fresh tone 
and, and a voice of, of these kids that I responded to. I read the script and I was like, whoa, I got to meet on this. It was the first movie I'd ever directed. My primary career has been in television, so I was lucky enough to sit and wait until I read something that really spoke to me. As two women who wrote the script, I mean, I think it was like, it definitely skews a little bit more female-centric, but then Gil came in and would add stuff like the motorcycle jump and the physical comedy, and he really made it a movie for, for everyone. When I got the job, I was unbelievably ecstatic. I couldn't believe I, I was gonna direct a feature film. And the next thing that I did regarding my approach, how I was gonna do it differently, and I'm not kidding, I went to Borders Books, and I bought six books on how to direct a feature film. I was so scared, because I thought, I can't direct a movie. This is too big, this is too scary, I'm terrified. And I literally, I spent, I'm not kidding, the, the next like couple of weeks reading all of these books. You know, he's really good. I told the folks at Disney, I will in no way make this film condescending to high school kids. I'm going to not look at this as a high school movie, but as a relationship movie that happens to have kids from high school in it. And I'll cue you because there's no way. And when you see her, then you got to do that. Right. Because you know, I want to know that you're playing coy. Sure. Okay. Hey, I love working with him. <laughs> yeah, no, he's fantastic. You know, um, He's so smooth and switched on. And he knows exactly how the script is read played and his comic timing is fantastic and visually he's been he's been brilliant no one was really sure how he was going to come out you know coming from you know he's a huge television director and his first movie and we were like well we know he's going to be you know fantastic with the comic timing what's he going to be like visually you need to set up a mean shot it doesn't need to be crazy one of the maybe goes across his back or something sets up the entire he's been doing some really cool creative stuff with the camera. Every shot has got some really kind of neat aesthetic that's going on, you know, whether it be like something with a crane or, uh, you know, a steady cam, a really long tracking shot. In my visual approach, I've been a photographer my whole life. To be able to position and point the camera in any direction was, for me, a joy. Here we go, and looking around, looking around, dancing, and action. He also, I'm sure, realizes that he's working with a bunch of teenagers who are probably not so confident in their acting ability yet. And, and so he's constantly encouraging us and having us commit. His presence and his energy have just been awesome. So David, you don't walk away, no one walks away, and what you're playing is great. I mean, it's just real subtle, just kind of like looking at your friend like Gil and he's always like, say to The thing that I love about Gil is that he's very upbeat and energetic and he keeps everyone really relaxed and really alive. And uh, the best thing about him as a director is that he'll tell you exactly what is wrong and exactly how you can fix it. And, and I, that's, I appreciate that a lot. We just had such a beautiful, fun experience. And I think it shows on the screen. The cast would constantly say to me, it's like going to camp. <laughs> we worked hard, but we were all working on something that we knew that was special. Everything just had that magical touch to it because we had so much talent. And look at the cast. We were very close to shooting and had not yet found the female lead. We had read hundreds of women. And I got a phone call from Marsha Ross, who was, the, who was the casting person for the film. She said, there's this really young girl who did an independent film when she was 15, but she shows a lot of promise. She's in New York, you're in New York. Would you be willing to meet with her if she, you know? Yeah. Knock, knock, knock. The way she looked, her demeanor, the way she shook my hand and looked in my eyes, the confidence and intelligence just from when I met her I thought to myself, seriously, I thought, if this girl can read English, I'm going to cast her. Kat is definitely a positive uh, role for women. She's very independent and strong-willed, and it's sort of saying that that's okay for a woman to be like that. I guess in this society, being male and an asshole makes you worthy of our time. She goes through a huge change throughout the course of the movie, and that's a great challenge as an actress. Julia just brought that strength and that intelligence, and she's a badass dancer, too. Yeah. So when she busts out the moves in that party, it was like, 
that was so exciting because she is a very like kind of regal person. So to see her work in that, I mean, impressive. <laughs> I had equal difficulty finding the male lead because he needed to be masculine without being trying to be masculine. He needed to be smart. He needed to be removed. He needed to be unbelievably charming. Should I uh, hit the lights? Oh, very clever, kangaroo boy. A complicated role, a very complicated role. And we had read a ridiculous amount of guys. Keith came in, and I remember very clearly we were at Disney, and I thought, wow. This guy is special. Look, no offense or anything, but your sister's without. You know, I know everyone, you know, likes her and all, but between the two of you, I mean, she doesn't compare. There was no question in my mind when I met him, and then we, re we read Movie Star. Movie Star. Andrew had us meet with him to hear his accent, to get the rhythm down in case we needed to change any of the dialogue. And uh, so we were supposed to meet him for coffee or something at, you know, 8 o'clock at night, and we ended up hanging out with him for about seven, eight hours. He was just this incredibly funny, charming, he was 18 at the time, and we just were just like, we can't get enough of this kid. Like, tell us more, tell us more, tell us another story from Perth. Like, he was just magnetic. I'll pick you up at 9.30 then. I don't know, where's Marlon for a yeah, that lunch? Matter, Do you want her? Right. I always wanted to play Hamlet, but I'd never play Hamlet until I was ready. And um, the other character in Shakespeare's works would be Petruchio, that I'd play first before Hamlet. And this is the closest thing I've had to playing Petruchio so far. A little bit shorter beat after why, don't you? Right. Beat, and then get right into really screaming. I watched you out there. I think every character that you play, you have to put a certain degree of yourself, or relate a certain degree of yourself and your life to him. I think I, I relate to him, you know, he's from Australia, and I'm from Australia. And um, he has brown hair, I've got brown hair, and it's curly. You know, he's not from around here. And it's hard to control him. You're not as vile as I thought you were. <laughs> <laughs> Ew, stop. You know, he jumps with the kangaroos in Australia. Sweet kid, sweet. Didn't know much about, uh, about he's always jumping around and dancing like a fool. He just had something about him. You know, movie stars have that thing that they're like, there's some kind of weird magnet in them. When you would talk to him, you just wanted to be him. Come on, me ladies. I said to Heath, I said, look, I just want to tell you, keep your head on your shoulders. Because when this movie comes out, your career is going to explode. And he looked at me and says, you know what, Gil? That's all future. All I care about is tomorrow and today doing a good job for you. Whatever the future brings, let it bring. Marissa really wanted to play Kat. She wasn't really like Bianca. I mean, she was listening to like indie rock and she was a little more dark and complicated than you might imagine. We found out afterwards that she, um, she went to Sarah Lawrence um, in real life because I think she was just like, if I'm not gonna get the part of Kat, I'm going to live the real thing. What do you do with a face like this? How are we gonna make her attractive? I don't know. What I saw in her was an effervescent spirit, and she just has that that those comedic chops. She nailed her, you know, when she read for me. I was like, whoa, where are you from? Wow. Oh, shit, Bianca, I'm sure you know this brand tomorrow. That's the making my date, please. Oh. oh, sorry, I did one punch. Um, I didn't envision myself playing Bianca at all because I've never really thought of myself as, like, the typical high school boy's view of what's to be had but you come see that she really does care about the people that are close to her and she's not just completely conceited look i don't know if i ever thanked you for going last night but it really meant a lot to me joe was the first cast member to sign on to the movie um he was coming off of third rock from the sun i play cameron and he is kind of the, he's the new kid. He comes in and he promptly falls in love with the most beautiful girl in school. What group is she in? We had a meeting with him where he kind of wanted to articulate some of his thoughts about the script. It was a really crucial meeting because him signing on would kind of be the first big attachment for the movie. It's he was trying it. to get a handle on the character and Kirsten whips out, he's like Luke Skywalker. I'm sitting there Star thinking. Wars. And Joe's just like sitting there nodding, like, all right, all right. And I'm sitting there thinking, what? He signed on. He signed on. So. 
Yeah. Right. They want to see you like, stand up for yourself. Right. But I think that Cameron should be the classier one. And I think if he yeah, knows violence, he's kind of stupid. Him say, okay, okay. For him, it was about the work. And the movie was about the work. And he just wanted to make sure that there weren't foolish lines for him to say. He said, that's all I really care. I love the script. But he said to me, just don't make me say dumb teenage things. And I said, I'm not going to do that to you. Joe, you know, I wanted to be friends with Joe. <laughs> he didn't want to get to know me. He didn't want to have anything to do with me. I immediately thought he was hilarious, and uh, you know he wouldn't admit it, but I think he thought I was funny too. I don't like Joe. In fact, uh, I, I, I was afraid you were going to ask me that. You look like my great uncle Milton. I've had enough of this guy. You know, I want to punch him in his glasses. He wears his little. I'm ready to get violent towards him, and I'm not a violent guy. He and Krumholtz had this great comedic charm. You know, it's like they had this. Repartee. They both have like really great comic timing, so when they're in scenes together, you just feel like a sort of that rat a tat feeling. David, I had directed on a show called Chicago Sons, and I just thought, this is one of the funniest guys since Woody Allen. And when I read the script, I thought, oh my god, David would be so good for this part. And then I just cast him. I didn't have to read him or anything, it was just. It's David Crumholtz. David definitely can deliver the shtick. You know, I am one of the few males who can lactate. Milk does a body good. Wait, what, what did I say? I mean, like, nobody's business. And then look at David now. You know, he's a consummate actor. Andrew played Jerry Dar, who is the movie Jackass. And he <laughs> is the sweetest guy in the world. So it was a total, you know reversal for him to go around acting like such a dick all day. <laughs> I'll stay away from your sister, but I can't guarantee she'll stay away from me. I'm like the bad guy. I end up kind of losing the girl, I guess, and just I kind of end up losing altogether, actually. But I do, I, I do, I look good doing it. Yeah. He has that confidence about the way he looks. You know, he just has that, because he's a gorgeous kid. And he grew up gorgeous. It, it changes you when you hear it growing up. I have no idea, but I hear it would change you. The really? scene where he's holding up the two photos, one in the black t-shirt and one in the white t-shirt, we totally stole those from the set. We're like, you have to keep this. So that's one of our little set souvenirs. <laughs> Everything kind of aligned because we had so much talent. Allison Janney's so brilliant. She plays Miss Perky, who is the guidance counselor, who's uh, pursuing a career of romance novelist while she's dispensing rather unorthodox advice to her. Kind of terrible her advice. Yeah. Terrible advice. <laughs> she's a terrible guidance counselor. Why is it you're such a dickhead? You say that like it's a bad thing. My character's name is Miss Perky. So, I think we all know what's up with her. <laughs> Would you rather be ravished by a pirate or a British rear admiral? I'm madly in love with Allison Janney. She's in love with me, too. She calls me, like, eight times a day. She has a wild need to be with me. I don't know why you're laughing. It's not funny. It's, it's an illness. It's an illness that she has. It was nice to get the offer, because I've never met, met Gil before. I've never worked with him before. And now I can say I'm sorry I have, because I'll never work with him again, because he takes himself so seriously, and he's, he's just um, he's a, he's a mean, little-spirited man. And when I say little, I mean little very and that's good just so you know joey only likes you for one, one... <laughs> gabrielle is so funny and so beautiful and she i think she was 26 when we shot that and she's playing a uh, high school sophomore i've been playing a lot of uh i guess bitchy characters on tv the way they were written wasn't exactly the way i would have liked to play them i wasn't allowed to do them the way i wanted to did you know uh yeah i think we have art together right neat when I saw the script, and it was written the way that I would have said it, not, you know, there was no way it, it could be changed where I would have to compromise myself, and I just love that she was so evil, and that's why that was what attracted me to it. Susan's so great. She's, she was one of the first actors on the set to come up and sort of say, like, I love this script, and I've memorized your names off the cover, so when I got to meet you, I would be able to say thank you, and she was just really excited to be part of the movie. Well, I mean, that was interesting, I think, partly because she is, like, the side where she's so obsessed and, like, in love with Shakespeare, and she kind of wants to die and join him in heaven. Mandela, just, not everyone can be in love with a dead guy. Well, not everyone is qualified. 
But at the same time, she'll like flip flop in like 180 degrees in one second. She'll be like, oh, cute boy. Unfortunately, she's married. When I find that, found that out, I cried all night because I mean, she was going to be it. You know, she was making eyes at me at the read through. I thought that she was just, you know, hitting, hitting her. She was just being friendly. But I do end up with her, and I, I am able to, to give her a very sweet, long French kiss uh, and, uh, that I enjoy highly because I don't get much action in my real life. Every time you even think about kissing a boy, I want you to picture wearing this under your halter. Larry Miller. He's a stand-up. He's hysterically funny. He also ad-libbed some, some brilliant mm -hmm. things in there. I'm down. I've got the 411, and you are not going out and getting jiggy with some boy. I don't care how dope his ride is. <sighs> he's brilliantly funny in every movie he's in, but I didn't know that he could be a dramatic actor. Who knew? There was a scene on the front porch with Julia Stiles. You know, mothers don't like to admit it when their daughters are capable of running their own lives. It means we've become spectators. And he just nailed it. Your heart just goes out to him. He played the concerned, hurt, passionate dad without going to what the obvious choice would be, would be tears. So one of the sweeter moments in the whole film. How funny was David Leisure when he got the arrow in the butt? Ow! That was really funny to me. Ow! Actually, here's what I do in the show. It's all right here on the David Leisure Memorial Chair. I get, uh, I get shot in the butt with an arrow. I get hit in the head with a golf ball. So, as you can see, the play revolves around my character. I love that Gil added all that little like background physical comedy element to it. Because <laughs> it makes like every scene you're kind of looking for like, who's going to get beat up in right. the back? <laughs> Everyone who came to the set, unbelievably prepared. Because they're pros. Even though they were young, these happen to be very, very special, talented, professional kids. As evidenced by, look at their careers. I mean, the past was extraordinary. You know, we got lucky. We were all set to shoot the movie in Los Angeles, and I did not want the movie compared to Clueless in any way. I was afraid of that, because Clueless was done so brilliantly. So I got Disney to give me permission to take the cast and crew to Seattle for five days so I can shoot all the exteriors there so that people would think the film was shot there. I went up to Seattle to look at some of these high schools. I got out of the little van, I saw the high school. I took four photographs of that school. I turned to the producer and said, let's go back to LA. I don't want to see the other schools. I'm shooting the movie here. This school is magical. This school feels Shakespearean. We're three weeks away from shooting. Three weeks. That's nothing for a feature film. And so we had three weeks to prep the entire movie. But clearly it all worked out. We actually didn't know that we were shooting in Washington until the table reading. And they said, oh, by the way, <laughs> here's the school we'll be filming at. It's in Washington. I heard you're not going to be able to spend the summer with your friends. You're going to Seattle. It's like, what? What's happening? Oh, God. When we got here, they showed us this school. And I was like, oh, when I first saw the school, I said, this is not a high school. You know, I go to L.A. public school, and L.A. public schools look like jail. The school I went to was just crap. And if I had went to that school, I would have wanted to go to school. I would have felt the urge and need to, to go. It overlooks the sound. It has this amazing stadium. I don't even know how good their football team is, but I hope they're good if they get a stadium like that. It was actually built in like 1890 or something. It was like a luxury hotel. And they turned it into a high school, and it's just gorgeous. It fits perfectly with the whole fairy tale Shakespeare uh, feel to the whole movie. It was emblematic of all things Shakespeare with the turrets and the architecture. And so Gil became really passionate about going there. And it's great because it's a, like a visual cornerstone of the movie. That's his voice too, that was cool. It's kind of the end of a montage of sequences that, of, of Patrick trying to woo Katrina, you know, like at the CD store, you know, trying to chatter up in different places. It's just not working. 
whatsoever. And like, this is my final act. This is like, you know, do all or die. And so I do. <laughs> I, I embarrass myself and get up there and sing in front of everyone. And I thought, wouldn't that be sweet if he's not singing a typical rock pop song, but a real love ballad? And uh, everyone seemed to like the idea. Very nice, Nick. Very nice, guys. Perfect timing. It was a lot of fun. I didn't, you know, I haven't sung in years, and I haven't danced in years, and uh, it was refreshing. It was a lot of fun. wanted a bit of Gene Kelly, Fred Astaire influence. It was totally uh, choreographed and then I just made it sloppy. <laughs> yeah. He had great common timing and um, it was something that he didn't get to explore too much in other roles, but I mean, I think in, you see in this movie, not only is he really witty and hilarious and charming, but I mean, he can also like sing and dance too. There was a great like fun, crazy, you know, passionate, wacky spirit in there. Kirsten is a famous poet. She's won awards. I think, yes, I don't know if you realize she, I'm a famous She has a book poet. of poetry that is actually published that <laughs> someone paid her to do. So, uh, yeah, she's like, okay, we have to write this poem. And she, I think she wrote nine of the things and I wrote one. <laughs> the 10 things I hate about your speech, that was the first take and only take that we shot that speech. The first take. And that speech makes people sob. I hate the way you're always right. I hate it when you lie. I hate it when you make me laugh, even worse when you make me cry. It was actually amazing to us to watch that first cut of that scene, to see her crying when she did, because we didn't expect that at all, and it was just like so moving when she did it. And we, we just always loved that she cried right at that moment. When she did that, and I am not exaggerating, I was literally holding my nose in my mouth because I was crying so hard, and I was trying not to make noise because A, I was so un- believably blown away by her skill and so incredibly proud of her i was just overwhelmed by her talent at that moment because it was staggering i mean she was 17 and she brought the entire crew to tears it seemed like the way it was written it was just always without tears but she to have her like break down in that in that key moment yeah. and do it so brilliantly it was vulnerable it's <laughs> nice that that poem lives on and there's you know you get to see it online and it's like kids seem to really like it so it's it's nice that something as esoteric as a poem could actually reverberate in the teenage community when Cameron and Bianca are looking through Pat's room for her concert tickets and, and they pick which bands that she likes and then Cameron goes and tells Patrick that Kirsten agonized probably for <laughs> Three weeks okay. over yeah. which bands were the coolest. The raincoats. Uh, bikini the, like, Kill. Yeah. Is that too commercial? <laughs> and I've never heard of any of these bands, so I'm blindly hey. trusting her. Hey. I love the two bands that are there, though. Letters to Cleo and Save Ferris. Ralph Saul was the music supervisor. And I'll be honest, he introduced me to a lot of the music that we ended up using in the film. We have to meet him here. It's the exact kind of movie you want to work on because it's a teenage movie that's filled from beginning to end with songs. Music plays throughout very consistently. There's live performances in the movie and songs become a main character of a movie. The songs that, that we're doing, um, I Know and Can't Stop, are both originals that we've been playing. Years. They're really live songs, which is why they work really well in the film in this part of the scene. Milwaukee! What? That's where it was last year! Say Ferris appears as the prom band, and I think the music they play is very conducive to just fun. It's like a party. 
We're doing a Niflo song called Cruel to be Kind for this particular scene. Of that song. I love it. I haven't stopped singing it for two days. Letters to Cleo was Kat's favorite band that she went to see at Club Skunk. That Patrick <laughs> somehow called in a favor at the end to get to play at the prom. We were never really sure how that line got in there, but I guess Gil decided let's keep that pretty blonde around and have her sing at the prom too. <laughs> God, I beg of you to put it on the DVD. <laughs> I, I, yes, I am a ham, and uh, I created a character so that I could play the character, and it was a school teacher. And I think I had two scenes in the movie, uh, which we shot, and I thought that they were funny. Now, I know the language of Mr. Shakespeare makes him a bit daunting, but no, this does not fulfill your foreign language requirements. <laughs> Because the language is, it's English, but... Gil wrote that for himself. Um, he decided he wanted to be in the movie, but his scenes just got trimmed for time. When it was too long, he graciously said, I'll cut my scenes first <laughs> before getting any of the kids stuff. As we know, Petruchio said to Hortensio, why couldn't my parents have named me Phil? One scene where Julie and I were completely unaware of what was going on. We thought we were just doing the scene again. We turned the corner and. I just wanted. Let me go. Shall we go to my office? She was there and Gil had a shirt off and they were like making out like in the hall and both Julie and I were just like. Gil just wanted to make out with me. <laughs> Go do something repulsive. I've got to make an orgasm last eight pages. Well, in that case, use the pirate and the admiral. Menage on the open seas. Ooh. I have a scene where I'm counseling Kat and Bianca. Yeah, that's so typical. I'm Girls. right. And my advice to them, uh, to Kat, actually, is to just physically beat up her sister. I have learned that communication and sharing are paramount. With that in mind, and as a professional, and as a woman, like yourselves, although much more developed, my advice to you would be, beat that squirrely bitch's ass. Beat her, beat her up, slap her silly, just do it. So I think that Miss Perky probably had a sister that she wasn't too happy with. <laughs> That's are a little unorthodox. My advice to you would be, Go give someone a really good blowjob. <sighs> okay. <clears throat> Today's scene is very exciting for Miss Perky because she gets a man. She gets two men. My first screen kiss is in this film. Perky, Chapin! You're supposed to set an example for the students. Mr. Chapin goes off, and I follow Gil. Obviously, we've had something happen because we're both smoking cigarettes. I don't know what that means. <laughs> to you? <laughs> wow. I felt good. Yeah. I like it. I am telling you, making that movie was easily the most joyful professional experience I have had in my 34 years of work. From the minute we started to the minute I delivered the picture, it was a blast. It was a blast. We had kind of an offbeat title, you know, 10 Things I Hate About You was our original title for the script, and we were certain that Disney was going to change the title. Like, they couldn't keep that title. It's too edgy. It's too weird. What is it? saying and then it became like the cornerstone of, of their marketing campaign. 
we climbed the side of a building to pose in front of a, a billboard and took pictures of ourselves jumping in front of it. It's really we pretty awesome. We missed our lives that day. It was probably not a very wise thing to do. <laughs> it's such a great feeling that 10 years after the film came out, the response is still that strong.